Welcome back to the Weekly YouTube channel. I'm your host, Owen, and today we're going to be doing a tier list going over the 2024 NFL draft eligible quarterbacks that I personally have watched and graded the film of. I have 15 players that I have personally watched and have put grades on, and now I'm going to present you with a tier list, ranking them how I personally see them. Now, this isn't me just giving you the grades and ranking them based on the grades or the top guy with the top grade. Obviously, Caleb Williams is at the top, and the guys with lowest grades are at the bottom. There is some kind of structure that's similar to that because the grades do reflect my opinions on these players. However, this is going to be more towards what looking at their potential and where I see them as pros as opposed to what their current grade is right now as a prospect. So you'll get it when we get into it. I'll make sure to explain as well as I can. So let's just dive right into the tier list. So here we have the tier list, thanks to tierlist.com, and I have all the quarterbacks laid out in alphabetical order. This allows for me to have some kind of not regulated or really like set order. I haven't really looked at what they look like in alphabetical order, so I'm not sure. Hopefully it's going to mix it up between not just doing top to down. I don't think it will be just because I know where some of the big guys and their big names are. Uh, this will just kind of break up the monotony. It won't just be an order of lists from best to worst kind of thing. So and that's what we're trying to do here with the tier list format, not just doing a top 10. So let's just dive right into it. Our first quarterback here is going to be Austin Reed from Western Kentucky. Uh, a D2 transfer to Western Kentucky uh, has been playing in that same system. The system we saw had produced Bailey Zappi to having great success when it comes statistically to that game following kind of a similar pathway to Zappi. I believe he was a Division II quarterback as well. Uh, Reed, personally, I wasn't a big fan of. I got put onto him by a friend of mine who uh, was really high on him as like a fifth round kind of guy, backup potential, maybe a pinch starter here or there. When I went and watched it, he just came off as a quarterback who was playing in D2 that was clearly a Division II quarterback that was trying to be asked to play at a higher level. Now, just for clarity's sake, there are some of these guys that my uh, resource that I have that gives me the All-22 tape of these players is not fully updated for all of these players. So some of these players have only seen the All-22 of their 2022 games so far. And Austin Reed is one of those. He's kind of lower on the priority chart or checklist. So this is based off his 2022 tape. Maybe if I see his 2023 tape and it's something very different, I'll make a separate video just updating that grade. But as of right now, Austin Reed looks like uh, or looked like in 2022 a Division II quarterback who was asked to jump up in level because he has the physical traits, the arm talent. He has a little bit of runner's running vision and slight mobility. I wouldn't really call it a strength of his. I think his running vision is definitely uh, better than some of these other pocket passer types. Uh, but he does have a strong enough arm and he was asked to come in and basically play this offense where they dictate where the quarterback is going to go a lot of screens like 90 percent screens design throws specifically whenever he take like took like deep shots you knew that's where he was going to go because that's where the play was designed it was one of two reads and if he finds the one that's open he's going to hit it now when he did take those deep shots he did have some good accuracy and touch a couple of receivers dropped it out of the back of the end zone and stuff like that he's playing at west kentucky not the greatest like pool of talent there when it comes to receiving options, but he just came off as a guy who was being puppeteered by the coach and outside of having a decent, if not like an NFL level arm, as well as some running vision and some decent accuracy down the field, I didn't really see much special out of him. So I'm going to put him here in our spring football category. Now let me talk about the spring football category for a second. Spring football, XFL, USL of a merger. We don't actually know what that's going to be called. So I just put spring football in general. These are the guys that have the potential, I'm um, very low on, the potential to go into the spring football league and play well, like a Jordan Ta'amu or a Ben DiNucci. You know, maybe get some uh, time on a practice squad here or there. Similar to like Luis Perez, Ben DiNucci right now, like I said. So that's where the spring football level is going to be. Next up is going to be high-end backup potential. These are the players that you draft and that you don't ever really expect them to be your long-term starter. You grab them in the day three rounds. Maybe he's a developmental guy who can come in and be a pinch starter if your actual starter ever goes down. never Always a guy you're looking to upgrade when it comes to being your quarterback if he's your starter. Uh, you know, being in that upper echelon of backup starters where you go into the season knowing if our quarterback gets hurt, it's going to be awful, but it's not the worst thing that can happen to us because we have that higher level backup star, uh, backup waiting in the wings. And these are the kind of guys you draft, uh, similar to like a Gardner Minshew type or a Tyrod Taylor type, where you know that you're confident in your backup to come in and you'll pinch hit for a couple games. Boomer Bust is the very wild and you know unpredictable players who have these potential, has the potential because they have these plays on tape where it's like they are showing big plays, whether it's their arm or their legs, or just the ability with their raw athleticism or some just jaw dropping plays that like are very inconsistent. And if you get them in your building, you're going to try to work on them and maybe you can make them hit. If you hit, they're going to be humongous of a hit because they're going to be later round guys that could potentially become a starter. 
or they'll just bust out and they have no real potential to be like a game managing backup quarterback type. So these are the guys who are either going to develop and become starting quarterbacks, or if they don't do that, they're probably out of the league. Uh, high floor, low ceiling. Guys that could come in and are probably once drafted are a top 32 quarterback, if not a top 34 quarterback in the league. So they should be starting on the majority of teams. These guys might not come in and start right away just in general because you don't know what the situation is that they're looking at. It's probably like a similarity situation where like they come in and you're bringing a veteran starter or one of those high-end backup guys like how Mike Glennon was when Mitch Trubisky was first drafted. Bring these guys in who you don't actually anticipate being a starter but who are good enough backups to play a couple games. You let them play and so let that uh, rookie you just drafted sit on the bench and see what kind of player they're going to be. And, you know, coming in, they'll probably still be better than the start that's playing ahead of them, just letting them see the game, not, you know, throwing it right in the fire right away. Uh, so they should be able to come and start and be one of the top, you know, one of the starting quarterbacks in the NFL. However, I don't really see them jumping into like the top 10 or top five range of quarterbacks, which is what the next two uh, categories are for. Top 10 potential players like Justin Herbert, Tua Tagovailoa, who are like have that potential to be that top 10 quarterback in the NFL consistently. Um, and I think there's a real big difference between being a top 10 kind of guy and a top five kind of guy perennially. Like Tua is a top five guy this year, but every year we weren't talking about him as a top five quarterback, whether it was due to injury or, what, or other you know limitations we kind of bestowed upon him. And same thing with Justin Herbert. You know, he's consensus top 10, but you have to really fight to get him to be top five. He's top five one week, but he's not the next. So these are the guys like the Joe Burrows, Josh Allens, uh, Patrick Mahomes of the world that are going to be consistently top five potential, which is a big difference in consistently top 10 potential. I don't know why I did that description after I already started the list, but whatever, we get out of the way now. Up next, we got Bo Nix here from Oregon, transferred from Auburn. And Bo Nix, I have a couple videos where I'm talking about him, whether it was the podcast or I was talking about the 2024 quarterbacks, how they're performing so far on my grades before I had the entire set complete, all 15. I think I had nine done at the time I did that podcast. Or when I was talking about the Oregon-Washington preview game uh, video, as well as the post game. And Bo Nix, I struggle with, because I know a lot of people like him as a first-round quarterback. I'm just not there with him. I think he went from being this gunslinging SEC freshman of the year at Auburn who would make some wild plays but then throw a terrible turnover every game. And now he's kind of more playing within a system in Oregon where he's controlled and won't turn the ball over but also isn't really one to push the ball down the field. And you don't really trust him to do that. So I kind of have a dichotomy with him. I did think he has a little bit lacking of confidence now after he kind of fell out at Auburn. As well as, I think Oregon is really trying to rein him in. I think they rein him in a little too hard. Uh, I do like him as an athlete. <clears throat> I think he does run the short to intermediate offense really well. I just wouldn't be really afraid if I went up against him to hit me deep. He'll be more of that game-managing type, dink and dunk with a strong run game kind of quarterback, which I think puts him solidly in the high floor, low ceiling. He's going to come in. He could be a starter day one. I think like Baker Mayfield or like something like you, uh, like a Brock Purdy type. Uh, I know he's kind of a, a name on the downslope right now, but like quarterback, a quarterback level like that where they can quarterback an offense to move the ball down the field with short the interim passes, the occasional deep shot, relying on their run game, their skill positions to really carry that offense as opposed to this elite quarterback. Up next, we have Cam Rising, the quarterback out of Utah. He's another player I have not seen any 2023 tape of yet, not because the Resource Bank does not have the All-22 of his 2023 games. It's because he is yet to play a game in 2023, and I doubt he will play a game in 2023. Uh, he blew out his knee at the end of last season, so now he's still on the recovery path from that. He could injury redshirt and come back next year, I think, with the amount of experience he has in college right now. Uh, to this point, and the amount of film he has on, on, on out there, I don't think he's going to get much better. I have a much better chance of uh, progressing when it comes to moving up on draft boards. So I think Cam Rising should just take advantage of it now, come back healthy and ready to go for the offseason all-star circuit, and light up the senior bowl, light up the combine, stuff like that. So Cam Rising got some decent mobility. We'll see how that looks after his knee injury. Um, I wouldn't really trust him to like have this really expansive offense, but he does have some good reads, misses some here or there, especially when there's pressure. Uh, like I said, his good mobility, his arm talent is a bit lacking. I wouldn't really trust him to make every NFL throw. And while I do think he is a veteran and smart and can lead his team to wins, I just think there's those physical limitations, which puts me at high-end backup potential. You want a guy like this who's smart, can make some plays off script, but isn't really that level of talent physically or mentally to handle against pressure, handle you know, get the ball down the field or attack every level of the field that you want to trust him to go out there and be your quarterback every single day, every single week on the NFL uh, season. Think of like a Josh Dobbs type, 
Tyrod Taylor, really, you know, dink and dunk, maybe one deep shot a game, uh, but really doesn't have the physical traits like a guy like Bo Nix might have, which puts him a slightly above what a Cam Rising is. Up next is Caleb Williams, and I'm not even really going to waste anybody's time. He's going to be the top five potential, number one quarterback in this draft class, clearly. And I've seen a lot of pushback, especially because he's struggling recently, about how he's not really even that good. And a lot of people are saying he's the best quarterback prospect of all time. You now people are just not seeing it, and I can see that now with the bad losses and the turnovers starting to rack up, that he's going to get start getting some pushback on this. But if you go back and look through the tape and watch the All-22 like I have, you will see a quarterback that is super rare when it comes to being able to make those off script throws, having the arm strength to flick it over his shoulder when he's running out of bounds and making a 40 yard completion, even when 99% of quarterbacks, not like people not named Patrick Holmes or Josh Allen, can make that throw with that level of arm strength and off script uh, creativity and even some daring, you know, foregoing turnover worthy plays. Uh, most guys would have thrown that away. He was able to make that play, and I think this is against Nevada this year. Uh, so he has those uh, wow moments that very few quarterbacks can do while also being able to hit the easy, you know, read, read, throw, three-step drop, hitch, hit the hit the open crosser kind of thing. He can go out there and do the mental stuff and dissect you as like a game-managing quarterback, but also has the physical talents and the creativity to really, you know, do more than just get the ball to his playmakers. Now, what I was worried about when as a passer was that he – was going to try to do some stuff that's going to put the ball in harm's way. And because he's in the college levels, uh, the takeaways won't really be there. And when he gets to the NFL, he's not going to be able to really do that. He, that's actually starting to happen now in the, in the college ranks. So he's going to have to pull that back a little bit, rein that stallion in. He's playing a little too fun, to a little too loose at the college level, which is what I thought would make him struggle a little more when he got to the NFL. But the fact that he's having this blip now while he's in the college season – uh, makes me actually a little more optimistic for when he goes to the NFL because now he'll be more attuned and more aware of protecting the ball and not doing these crazy plays that may put the ball in danger. He'll make crazy plays, but only if it's going to be his receiver or no one else. So actually, I'm, this down stretch he's having in his college career is actually something that's more promising to me than a negative. And just the last note, uh, he's not like the most elusive or fastest quarterback in this draft class, but I do think he's the best runner. Uh, I know the Mahomes comparisons get thrown out a lot, and I don't really like comparing him to a guy like Mahomes because that's such a high, lofty expectation. But the one place I do want to compare him to Mahomes is with his rushing ability. Mahomes is not, you know, Lamar Jackson or Josh Allen, but he is the most effective runner when it comes to the NFL where he knows what the coverage is, he knows what the routes are taking the guys. He's aware of who what spaces are going to be open if he does decide to break the pocket, and he does and he, so every time he runs he gets like 20 yards on crucial third downs because he's just so aware and keenly aware of what's happening everywhere on the field at the same time, and everyone's so afraid of his arm that they're leaving him space to run. So Caleb Williams is probably a better athlete than Mahomes, and but he also has that same rare ability to understand what run lanes will be there because of where the DBs are going with the receivers and etc. So I think he is actually the most dangerous running quarterback in the draft class, even though he's not the most athletic. Sticking with athletic quarterbacks, we're going to go next to Cam Ward, another guy that I don't have the 2023 All-22 on yet, but I do have the 2022 All-22. Coming from Incarnate Word to Washington State, he has been one of my favorite my guys, and I think the the draft sphere is going to slowly start catching up on him that I have been on for a whole year. I actually did Cam Ward expecting him to come out last year, but it was only one year at Washington State after Incarnate Word, so he stayed another year just to really boost that draft stock, and I think he's it's paying off. Now, what I saw in 2022 was a guy who was athletically gifted, both in his arm and in his legs. Uh, however, looked like a guy who was not polished, not refined, especially with his feet. He would not bring his feet in with him to his throws. Never really asked him to do these traditional dropbacks. And his lack of feet coordination often led to, uh, you know, really bad misses in the passing game, whether it's dirting the ball, receiver's feet, overshooting by five yards. And I'm really excited to see if he's able to fix that in 2023. However, with the amount of pure physical talent accuracy and all these other things he brings despite having some wonky mechanics uh i do think cam ward is going to be in that top 10 potential even though i have him graded like it's around the same as bo nix i do think his upside and potential is better than somebody like nix is uh just because he's a better athlete has a better arm and is willing to make those kind of plays and keep the ball resp- you know safe as opposed to nix who when he was allowed to try to push the ball down the field turn the ball over Ward pushes the ball on the field and keeps it safe at the same time. Doesn't need to be regulated or reined in to like a more conservative offense. Up next, another guy that 
doesn't really need a lot of introduction is going to be Drake May. We're going to slide him immediately into top 10 potential. Not quite at the level of Caleb Williams, but somebody who I think is the clear number two quarterback in this draft class. I think he's there's there's more difference between him and the next guy than there is between him and Caleb Williams, even though there is kind of a significant difference between Drake May and Caleb Williams. Uh, in 2023, Drake May finally has some like legitimate NFL reps on tape, whereas like with the offense North Carolina was running back in 2022 and 2021, even with Sam Howell, uh, it was very much much not in, in in not indicative of like an NFL offense. It was very much a college offense that now we see Sam Howell kind of struggling and he got to the NFL level having to wait a whole year to start just because they're not really mentally ready there. I think Drake May has shown that he's mentally ready for an NFL caliber offense on top of having crazy arm talent, being able to make plays off script, having the accuracy uh, I do think that like more traditional NFL drops under shotgun or under center and of just out of the shotgun all the time will benefit him in the long run. But right now he can come in and have that. I think he can have that Justin Herbert level rookie season where he's immediately after year one talked about being a top 10 quarterback in the league. I would say he'll probably, he'll probably hover more around like the 15 where Caleb Williams would probably be like 12 just to be realistic. But he should come in and be able to perform well because he has so much athletic talent. Well, both in his arm and in his legs, but also has more reps as a pro pro style quarterback now with North Carolina, and can make those plays off script similar to how Caleb Williams can. Uh, I don't think he's nearly as creative as Caleb Williams and not as good as a runner as Caleb Williams, but I do think he is one of those guys that is going to succeed as a modern NFL quarterback. And then up next we have JJ McCarthy, somebody I'm a lot higher on than I feel like the public at large is when it comes to talking about quarterbacks from this draft class. I'm gonna put him squarely in the top ten potential kind of guy. I was floating him between top ten potential and high floor, low ceiling. I do have a first round grade on JJ McCarthy, and the reason I was between top ten and high floor, low ceiling was because I feel like he is currently executing that Michigan offense perfectly, beautifully. Is one of the best quarterbacks in college football right now because that Michigan offense is being executed to perfection by him. However, does that mean he's going to struggle when he get put, gets put into a system that he can't perfectly manage at the NFL level? Or is he going to be specifically a system quarterback at the NFL level as well? I feel like his upside athletically with his legs is what's putting him in the top 10 potential as opposed to high floor, low ceiling. Because if he was more of a pocket passer with a big arm who could excel in a specific kind of uh, system when it comes to like Michigan or wherever he gets drafted, then I feel like high floor, low ceiling, but like the top 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 of that tier uh would have been good for him but the fact that he can make plays with his legs he has escape ability he can extend plays in his creative off script i feel like i would like to see him a little more creative off script uh because like i said he does play a lot in that system and really is kind of confined to it and he doesn't really go crazy off script and really makes plays out of nothing if it's not there he might just throw the ball away he's a little more conservative uh but i feel like that is in his game a little bit what's his arm strength what the le- uh, the leg ability so i do think that top 10 potential is there if not it's like if there was a tier between the two i probably would have put him there but there wasn't enough guys to fit that tier to make a, make it a you know a tier for it itself i think mccarthy is going to be good i'm just worried about if he gets put in a situation like how what just fields is in with chicago right now if he's going to be able to overcome that and not be ruined by that situation as opposed to like a Caleb Williams or a Drake May, who even if they don't succeed right away in that uh, position, they'll be good enough that they can still build around them and they won't be ruined going into the future when they finally have a good team around them. Similar to what Justin Fields is going through right now. I think that's a, a realistic future for J.J. McCarthy just from how he's playing at Michigan right now. I hope to see him land in either a really good spot for him, like like a Minnesota or something like that, where they have uh, a cast of players as well as coaching staff to really support him, or he starts showing that he can play off script a little more, and then I'm not as worried about that. But So either way, I think there is potential for him to grow as a quarterback, which is why I have him the top-down potential. Our next quarterback is Jaden Daniels, LSU, trans, or transferred from Arizona State to LSU. He's going to be our first boomer bust quarterback. Uh, and where the boomer bust comes from is that Jaden Daniels is really struggling right now with progressions and reading through defenses. Uh, there's a lot of plays where he just locks onto his first read and then throws it, whether or not if he's open or not. If he doesn't throw it there, he either takes off or just throws it out of bounds. Uh, I feel like he's really behind the ball when it comes to reading through defenses, and he's kind of regressed in that as uh, his college career has gone on. I felt like last year, LSU, and this year, LSU, Jaden Daniels, is a little bit worse when it comes to progressing through defenses. Now, he does have an NFL level arm. Nothing amazing or anything like not not like Cam Ward, JJ McCarthy, Drake May, Caleb Williams, those top tier guys, which is why he's not in the top ten potential. Uh, but I do think it's an NFL level arm. He can make NFL throws. 
and he is like the best pure athlete when it comes to the quarterback position in this draft class. Now, like I said, Caleb Williams, I think is the best running quarterback. Jaden Daniels is the best runner who plays quarterback. Uh, he's the best when it comes to straight line speed. Him and Jordan Travis are kind of tied when it comes to elusiveness in the open field and using their legs to pick up yards on the side QB runs. Uh, I do think he has the ability to be like a Lamar Jackson light at the NFL level, but if it's all if you can teach him the mental side of the game and you know fix that part that he's kind of lost throughout his college career. So that is why I have Jaden Daniels and Boomer Bust. And sticking with Boomer Bust, we have Joe Milton the third for Tennessee. I feel like everyone's heard about Joe Milton. Absolute cannon of arm. He will come in, draft at the NFL. He will have the single best arm in the NFL when it comes to pure arm strength and being able to throw it 90 yards on the field. Literally. That's not an exaggeration. I think he could throw it 90 yards. Yeah, Joe Milton, I've seen him throw 70-yard dimes, and he does have some deep ball accuracy. I think where his accuracy is a big question mark, which is why he's in the boomer bust, where like he progresses slow. His short to intermediate accuracy is consistently awful. Like he'll hit one player or two, and the Tennessee offense doesn't really help him out much when it comes to progressions or having hard, difficult throws in the short to intermediate. They either have completely blatantly wide open receivers or tough contested catches over the middle. And he doesn't throw accurate balls even when the guys are wide open, except for when it's deep. I feel like his deep ball accuracy is actually the best part of his accuracy kit. However, that's not going to be the case when the game's faster and the, double, the deep balls are going to be taken away from them. You're going to make sure you take away the deep ball from Joe Milton, make him beat you in the short to intermediate, and with his legs, which he isn't that great of an athlete either. I think he's a little better than what people give him credit for, but I still don't think he's a fantastic athlete. So... Uh, I, he's a boomer bust because he can hit those gigantic plays and he has the jaw dropping arm talent and decent, if like like l- league below average athleticism, but still some athleticism. So that's what makes him boomer bust is that like if you can really rein in that arm and coach him up to be a better overall passer than just a deep ball guy. Uh, I think he could be an NFL starter, but it's going to take a lot of work, like three to four years. The Jordan Love process, except you're not going to draft this guy in the first round. You're going to grab him in like the third at the earliest, but I really would take him like day three just because there's so much work that needs to be done. And he's not a particularly young quarterback either. He's in his sixth year as a uh, college player because he took some red shirts and he transferred from Michigan. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done on a relatively older quarterback. So that's why he's in the boomer bust category, despite his physical gifts. Up next is Jordan Travis. And I'm going to put him at high-end backup potential. I really do like Jordan Travis. I think I like him a lot more than other people do. Uh, I don't think there's a lot of hype for him to go in day two. So I don't know why people are really pushing back on that when I don't really think the hype is there overall. So there's like kind of a phantom argument people are making. But as like a day three guy that I could bring in, has really good athleticism and is like one of the most effective runners of the ball. I think he's the second best when it comes to running the football as a quarterback or scrambling behind Caleb Williams and just above Jaden Daniels. Uh, I do think his athleticism and elusiveness, I think he's the most elusive quarterback uh, in this draft class when it comes to running, is really good. And he maybe takes off a little more than I want him to. I would like him to sit in and really read through his progressions, go back to the backside on some plays to find the open receiver. Uh, I do think that, though, he can use his legs as a weapon in the NFL, whereas some other guys like maybe Bo Nix couldn't. Uh, where Jordan Travis becomes backup potential as opposed to like high floor, low ceiling, or even top 10 potential is, one, the lack of arm strength. And the lack of arm strength comes from one of the most egregiously bad throwing motions I've ever seen. It's very much... Not a dip and come through. It's just here and push forward. It does no like, or not no, but like very rarely does he have the full throwing motion. It's so much. It's not even like a three fourths throwing motion. It's like a half a throwing motion, where it's just up and forward. There's no draw back. There's no wind up. Um, now a quick release is good, but you need to have some kind of motion there to get some more power and be able to throw it in there with their, with your arm. So I do think his accuracy and arm strength suffers a lot from his lack of arm motion and throwing motion. But I do think in general that his feet are good, his progressions are decent, and he has that athleticism. So I do I do think if you bring him in as a backup guy, you can do a lot worse. Like he's like a better version of Kellen Mond, and I don't think you'd actually draft him in the third round kind of like how Kellen Mond went. So I, I, I'm a big Jordan Travis guy. I'd probably take him over Cam Rising, even though they have similar skill sets. I think Jordan Travis is just a better overall version of Cam Rising. Uh, even though I think Cam maybe it has a better bit of a better arm because his throwing motion isn't god awful, but if you fix Jordan Travis's throwing motion, who knows what the limit or what the uh, 
potential is. He is shorter, 6'1", but he has that mobility. If you, fix, if you rework his entire throwing motion and can unlock some better accuracy and throwing power, he may even be a starter at the NFL level. But I don't want to bank on reworking somebody's entire throwing motion. It worked one time with Josh Allen, and after that, it not really, not really successful. Up next is a quarterback that's really close to my heart as a Washington Huskies fan, Michael Penix, and I'm going to put him in high floor, low ceiling, right alongside Bo Nix. I just, I finally dropped him out of my first round grades uh, recently just because I really felt like those games against Arizona State and uh, who was it? Stanford, he just really struggled under pressure. And I felt like, especially in the Arizona State game, they were just sending cover zero blitzes at him and he wasn't able to solve them at all. I know his wide receivers didn't really give him a lot of help, but at the same time, he wasn't, he doesn't use his legs to extend plays as well. He's an athlete. Like, I think he can run fast, I guess, but like he doesn't use his legs nearly enough when he's asked to do RPOs. He pulls it at the wrong time. He gives it the wrong time. He's just not a running quarterback, despite what his past to Indiana and what he does show sometimes at Washington would tell you. He's just not a running quarterback in general. Uh, I think he has a great arm, one of the best arms in the class, and his accuracy is pretty good. His throwing motion's a little wonky. I don't know if it's just because he's a southpaw and it looks weird. I just feel like it's a little more loopy and over the top than you would like from a throwing motion. It's kind of more clunky, opens him up to more like strip sacks from behind um, than I'd like. So he's got some big flaws, especially when it comes to the poise under pressure. That showed up last year against Oregon State in the All-22. This year against Arizona State, just watching the broadcast, you could clearly see that he was struggling under pressure. So a guy who can come in will probably be one of the top 32 quarterbacks in the NFL when he first enters the league. But I don't know how far up that list he's going to get. Like, is his ceiling at 16 or 15? Are you going to always want to look to move on from him? Probably, which is why I think he'll be like a second-round pick kind of quarterback. Up next, we got Quinn Ewers, and he's going to be in the high floor, low ceiling bracket. I do think he might come back for another season. He probably should. Uh, he just got hurt again for the second year in a row. Uh, his throwing motion is quick and compact. I think he has some decent arm strength, not the greatest or anything like that. Uh, I do wish he would use his legs a bit more and work a little more off script. However, that's just not his game, and he is just more of a pocket passer, work in the system, find your open receivers kind of guy. Uh, but as, a, as, a, as quarterbacks go who are built like that, I think he's one of the better ones. So I think Quinn Ewers is probably one of the guys that's going to come off this list more likely than anybody else. Uh, but I do like him as a guy who can come in and run like a Shanahan offense, really make those quick, the short, the short the intermediate throws pretty accurately, maybe push the ball down the field once or twice, and just take command of an offense and run this kind of run-heavy uh, Shanahan, West Coast-style offense pretty well, which is becoming a lot more popular in the league. So high floor, low ceiling, that's kind of self-evident. Next up, we have Sam Hartman, who I'm putting in the high-end backup potential. Uh, I didn't really like him when he was at Wake Forest just because I hate Wake Forest's uh, offensive scheme with the whole walk-up RPO thing. Uh, I really just hate it. And I think that when he moved to Notre Dame, now he has more pro-style reads and things like that. He is excelling at that. His arm isn't the best, but I do think it's a little better than people give him credit for. His mobility isn't really that good. So I think he's physically limited, but showing now that he can move to a more pro-style offense in Notre Dame than Wake Forest, but like anything's more pro-style than Wake Forest, including Notre Dame. Uh, I do think he's shown the ability to adapt and understand schemes and improve mentally as a quarterback. So that would that's really just like the perfect ensemble when it comes to what you're looking for in a backup quarterback. Somebody who can understand the offense, get it down, help your uh, starting quarterback understand the concepts that they're introducing that week. And also, if he needs to come in, he can t- take care of the ball. He's a little he's accurate, not the greatest arm, not the greatest when he's off uh, on the move, but can come in and execute some semblance of an offense at the NFL level. So that's why I think Sam Hartman has the potential to be one of the higher-end backups in the league. Two more left, we have Spencer Rattler, one of my biggest my guys in this draft class, just because I was such a a Spencer Rattler hater in 2020 when he was talked about as being like the best quarterback in that class and potential number one overall pick. And then I followed his career path after that, you know, originally having as a fifth-round guy in 2020, and slowly but surely, as he transferred to South Carolina and played an extra season there and now has some good weapons there, I think he is finally starting to grow into that quarterback I think people want him to be in 2020. I'm going to put him at high floor, low ceiling. I do think he genuinely would be one of the top 32 quarterbacks tomorrow if he stepped into the NFL right now. He, like, he's got to be better than even Brock Purdy, Josh Dobbs, slash uh, Clayton Toon, uh, whoever the Vikings are going to start a quarterback. Now I guess it's Josh Dobbs and Jaron Hall there. Even like the guy like P.J. Walker who stepped in for the Browns, I think he'd be better than him as well. There's, he would start on a couple of these NFL teams right away if not having to battle for the job first. Uh, 
especially his game against Georgia this year was really eye-opening. He was very accurate, was able to put the ball in some incredible windows and just have his receivers drop them. And he was constantly under pressure that game. He has some athleticism and mobility. I don't think it's as good as he believes it is, but he's got that baseball player kind of athleticism where he can pick up some yards. He won't be like a consistent presence in the run game or really scare defenses, but he can definitely pick up like 50 yards rushing in a game if he needs to. He has that baseball arm, the baseball player release. I really like his talent as like a mid-second round kind of guy as opposed to a first round guy like he was being talked about in 2020. He will come in, run an offense. He can actually push the ball down the field better than a guy like Quinn Ewers or Bo Nix. So I do think he's slightly better than both those guys. And he has a little more athleticism than a guy like Quinn Ewers and is willing to make plays off script which Bo Nix might be able to get back to now that he's going to be going out to the NFL and not being held back by Oregon. Uh, but we'll see. But right now, I like Spencer Rattler. Of the guys in this high floor, low ceiling bracket, even though I Michael Penix is a higher grade, I think I would take Spencer Rattler in the second round over all of these other guys. And our final player down here is going to be Tanner Mordecai. Uh, I'm sorry to make you wait all this long to see another spring football quarterback. Played at SMU. Kansas City Chiefs fans might know him from watching Rasheed Rice highlight videos. Uh, I call him Twinkle Toes because he just constantly dances his feet in the pocket. Super weird and not really like traditionally taught. I am very put off by his foot mechanics. His accuracy suffers because of it. He does have a decently strong arm. However, I do think he's uh, inaccurate, like I said, with his footwork and overall just in general inaccurate. Uh, He's not a great runner. Uh, I think he's perfect for a spring football type of guy or maybe like the Canadian Football League where he can go in. And he can use his experience as starting quarterback at SMU and now Wisconsin and get some playing time, understand offenses a little more. But outside of that, I think he just really offers very little when it comes to a high baseline to be like a starter or a backup and very low potential to grow into a starter or a backup. Uh, So that's why I have him here at spring football. I think Austin Reed is more likely to grow as a quarterback and become like a backup quarterback in the NFL because he's a Division II guy now playing D1 in an offense that really restricts him. Whereas Tanner Mordecai, we've seen several years at D1 and SMU now and also at Wisconsin where he has just struggled through to identify coverages, throws bad interceptions, really lacks physical traits, as well as just his technique is everywhere. So I do think he is not really have the potential of a backup or a starting quarterback. But yeah, that is my quarterback tier list. That's all 15 quarterbacks I believe will come out in the NFL draft in 2024. Um, You know, Shadir Sanders isn't on here, obviously, and neither is like Riley Leonard. I truly believe those guys are going to go back for another year. Maybe even Quinn Ewers now with the injury, he'll go back another year. But this is how I look at the class right now. And if you guys have any opinions, leave a comment or like. I think I'm going to have two of my buddies uh, who are also draft aficionados come on and debate this with me because they have very different opinions on these quarterbacks than I do, which is always good for content and always good for conversations. So look out for that soon. And other than that, I'll see you guys in the next one.